Welcome, PCAST members and the public, to our first PCAST meeting of 2023. This is an important year for us, as many of our efforts are coming to fruition. Now, I remind everyone that this meeting is public and it is being recorded. I also wish to let you know that PCAST member Penny Pritzker, founder and chairwoman of PSP Partners, has decided to step away from PCAST so she can focus on her many other commitments. And we thank her for her work and sage advice during her time on PCAST. I now pass this meeting to Maria Zuber to introduce the discussion of the latest PCAST report. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, today, we're going to have a public discussion among PCAST members a report from our wildfires working group, modernizing wildland firefighting to protect our firefighters. This report has benefited from considerable input from the firefighting community, from federal agencies, and from Pe President Biden, who's made clear to us how much he cares about the professionals who bravely protect life and property. Wildfire events are occurring with increasing frequency due to the changing climate. And here to talk about some recommendations that we have, I'd like to introduce John DeBerry and Kathy Sullivan, who co-chair our Wildfires Working Group. John and Kathy, I'd like to invite you to provide a short presentation of your findings and recommendations. And then after that, we will have a discussion where you can answer, you and other working group members can answer questions from the PCAST members. John and Kathy, take it away. Kathy? Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'll kick things off and then pass the baton to John, who's already saved me once. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on to the next slide and get into the meat of our process and our report. Uh, you see here the members of our working group, uh, John and myself at the center of the group there, Inez Fung, Bill Press, Steve Pakala, uh, and former Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. And let me just note that we were all saddened by the passing, the unexpected passing of our friend and colleague, Ash Carter, late last year, who made tremendous contributions to this working group and will be very, very sorely missed. Next slide, please. So this is about modernizing wildland and urban interface firefighting. And the question that PCAST asked itself is there in bold. How can we make firefighting safer and more effective? Uh, our key findings are summarized here. If you're out on the ground trying to run a, especially at the mega fire scale, run an active fire scene, an urgent and unmet need is to have vastly improved situational awareness among all the fire companies on the scene the same picture, the same visual and mental picture of what's happening where. Secondly, we observed that our country does not have a dedicated science and technology organization that can develop and deploy technologies to make wildland firefighting safety. There's no infusion path to bring new devices, new technologies into play that could help our firefighters out on the ground. Thirdly, there is a wealth of untapped historical data uh, satellite measurements, basically, that's what overhead assets mean, that if made more widely available to the research community, uh, could enable more, uh, more accurate and predict even predictive models of active fires and their, their behavior. And finally, there are some avenues in which robotics could be integrated with remote sensing to support firefighters with autonomous and semi-autonomous or you know, human-coached, human-directed systems. Next slide, please. So we'll hop into our recommendations here in summary. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you, but again, communications, connectivity among the fire companies out on the ground on the scene of a large fire, interoperability of communications and data display devices among them. Those things, if improved, would allow our field teams to immediately assess. We should, we should immediately assess, adapt, and field technologies that can improve all three of those things. There are technologies available that can do this. Certain uh, county and state fire companies have been using them. Our goal with this recommendation is to begin to bring those into the federal firefighting workforce. The Federal National Interagency Fire Center 
uh, with support from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Federal Communications Commission, and Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, combined leadership and partnership in this could make that happen. Uh, and this would require some funding above the current base levels that are dedicated to wildland fire response, principally in the Departments of Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Next slide. Secondly, we propose to reverse the trend of rapidly growing wildfire suppression costs by enabling the aforementioned improvements. And to do that, we recommend establishing a joint agency executive office, a combined authority that would have a clear mandate and the clear authority to direct acceleration of across the entire firefighting enterprise of the kinds of technologies that we just referred to. This organization to be effect effective would need to have clearly delegated decision-make authorities from the cabinet level secretaries involved, as well as the, the mandate, uh, the task, and the budget needed to develop and execute a unified technology roadmap across the federal firefighting forces. Uh, the recommendations that follow, which John will present, could be championed and shepherded by that joint office once it was established. John, over to you. Thanks, Kathy. Next slide. Uh, our third recommendation broadens our focus here beyond this topic of situational awareness that Kathy covered and considers the full operational sequence of detection, alert, response to the fire, and ultimately its containment and suppression. So we're recommending that a technology assessment be conducted to evaluate tools from throughout the federal government, places like the DOD, for example, as well as private sector from allied nations and others that can enhance, again, the safety and the effectiveness of, of wildland firefighting. The report describes some examples of those technologies that are already available and could be brought to bear here. Now, it's important that this assessment include a prioritized roadmap for the testing and transition into operations of all of these technologies across all of the relevant federal agencies. We're recommending that the U.S. Fire Administrator take the lead in this effort until that joint office that Kathy described is stood up. We've had great interactions with uh, the Fire Administrator, Dr. Moore Morell, and uh, if her office has provided adequate resources and with partnership uh, with other agencies like NASA, we're confident this can be done really well. Next slide. Now, our fourth recommendation relates to opportunities to give firefighters earlier and more accurate information about where the fire they're fighting is about to go by leveraging modeling tools like AI. Now, a pressing need here is data on past fire events to both train and validate those models. In the US alone, there have been more than a million and a half wildfires since the year 2000. And so there have been a lot of events that potentially could be used for that training and validation. Tens of millions more fires are occurring overseas in a diversity of conditions that are really ideal for this type of model development. The archives of some of our national space-based assets could be used here. Some of our satellites uh, could be useful here. The challenge is that most modelers currently don't have access due to the classification level of that data. And so we're recommending that DOD review the classification level of that data with the goal of increasing access where national security considerations can be appropriately balanced. As with the, the fire administrator, we've had great discussions with General Shaw and Space Command, and we see opportunities here to achieve what's been done in the declassification or, or reclassification of other space-based data in recent years. Uh, next slide. Our final recommendation looks further to the future and seeks to help extend the reach and endurance of our firefighting force. As we describe in the report, we're already well past the point where demand for firefighting resources is outstripping the supply. So this recommendation seeks to leverage emerging advances in robotics, autonomous systems, et cetera, to augment our firefighting capacity. There's an opportunity for various federal agencies to help create a bridge from what today are simplified lab proofs of concept of some of these technologies and to bring them into meaningful field demonstrations. Some emerging private sector efforts are already seeking to do this. Uh, for example, the XPRIZE Foundation, which you're, you're probably familiar with in the context of commercial space flight through the XPRIZE uh, that they gave many years ago. They're seeking to do something similar in this space of autonomous firefighting technologies to get to fires faster, to provide that situational awareness that Kathy mentioned, and even possibly to physically intervene on a fire, uh, supporting the containment. But there are significant challenges to overcome here in terms of deconflicting the airspace, managing communications with the firefighters, 
and for demonstration purposes, even finding sites within the US to conduct these types of tests. So we're recommending that NASA's Aerospace Mission Research Directorate initially take the lead here, again, until that joint office is stood up. They would be coordinating the federal support of these efforts. Uh, that Aerospace Mission Directorate in NASA is already deeply engaged with the fire services on some of these issues. This is, of course, a long-term effort. It really pushes the frontier of what's possible technologically. But I'm really excited about this uh, recommendation because I think it's going to attract a lot of new, young, diverse talent to this really important problem. So that's a brief discussion uh, or summary of our recommendations. And Kathy and I would be glad to open it up for discussion now. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, uh, Kathy and John. So, um, so I'll ask PCAT, PCAS members to uh, raise your virtual hands if you have comments or questions. And um, let me take the chair's priority and, um, and ask a, a couple of questions here to get things started. So the, um, the, the focus on your presentation here um, was on on the actual recommendations, but um, but I'd I'd like to ask you to um, uh, talk a little bit about the the process of consultation. Um, you know, particularly among firefighters. I mean, nobody knows. You know, you talked about some of the meetings that you held with firefighting leadership, but nobody knows more about what a firefighter needs uh, out in the field than the firefighters out in the field. So I'd ask, uh, I'd ask that if you, one or both of you could talk a little bit about that. L let me give a, a start on that, uh, Maria, and a couple of comments. Our very first consultation was with a, a, someone who used to be at, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Kate Dargan, who was the former supervisor of fires in California. So we started right away with someone who knew the firefighting challenges intimately. Um, over the course of our studies, we talked with uh, key leadership and members of the Forest Service, the Department of Interior's firefighting forces, as John mentioned, the fire administrator. And we also spent a lot of time talking with the people who represent all those agencies, the ground level troops and coordinators who represent those agencies at the National Interagency Fire Center. And you know something that I observed, I, I hearkened back to a piece of my own experience. You know, if if you met me at the bottom of the stairs when I stepped off a space shuttle and asked me how did it go, well, was there anything you needed? My answer would have been tightly confined to the specific things that would have helped me on a tactical level on this most recent flight, because I was still full of all of that thought and that experience. If you asked me even the same question even a month later. I would have stepped back and had a wider perspective and likely talked to you about more fundamental upgrades to the instrumentation and displays in our cockpits, for example, that were lagging far behind technology at the time. And that if upgraded, would make it far safer to fly that, that challenging vehicle that the space shuttle was. I think we saw some of the same things in our consultation with firefighters. If you talk to someone whose job is 100% boots on the ground, swinging an ax, clearing the ground, they necessarily want better gear to wear, better protective clothing, more of them out in the field, uh, better pay and conditions to work in. And those are all completely valid points. But what we observed is there's a lot of attention on those factors uh, that impair some of our firefighting capability today. There's been virtually no attention on this complementary technology and the role that it could play in also augmenting their capability. And so that's why we focused in on that. And that we heard loud and clear at the National Interagency Fire Center, where we were talking with engine company commanders, you know, people want still active firefighters on scene, but one or two levels up in the command structure, they're desperate for the kinds of technologies that we're talking about here. They see some of their state and county counterparts uh, using them, more able to access them and bring them into their usage. They themselves have no pathway, have no budget, don't have a, a body of expertise to help them do that. John, anything you wanna add? I think you said it well, Kathy. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, we have, um, we have lots of questions from the members here and um, let's kick that off with uh, um, our co-chair, uh, Arthi Prabhakar. Thanks, Maria. Um, very brief uh, comment. First, uh, I wanted to thank the team. Um, the, uh, wildfires are such an important problem, a growing problem, part of the climate crisis that we're dealing with, exacerbating that. 
Uh, but I think it's not that easy to figure out practical things to do about and uh, having firefighters be more capable. And I think uh, this report does a great job. I wanted to touch on something that I think you all uh, did get to in the report, but just to underscore, um, and I, I was reflecting on my experience in the Defense Department and the, the what I saw over and over again is that the most powerful technology tools in the world really don't mean anything until uh, the training and uh, the, the, the concepts of operations until people actually know what to do with them. And I, I really wanna just commend the, the team here for highlighting that, that it's not just getting, you know, not just procuring the off the shelf technologies or developing new ones, but it's really that integration with training. And I think this is, um, my view is I think you've done a terrific job. So thank you for that. Thanks, Arthi. And, and I would just add that, that that point on training is something we also heard going to NIFSI and other places that there's a hunger to be able to use these technologies, but we're going to have to structure uh, an ability for them to find that time when they're not fighting fires or refurbishing equipment or doing the hazardous fuels removal. So we're asking these firefighters to do a lot already. We're going to need to make that training an efficient process. And that recommendation uh, about you know, field tests and so forth gets at that same idea, Arthi, about CONOPS. There's not, a, there's not a regulatory framework or an interagency operational framework yet that is unified enough that they can collaborate on using some of these new technologies. And as we saw with 9-11, as we see in the DOD, if everyone's got different radios, if everyone's thinking of the problem in a different way, you don't really have a, an effective unified fighting force. Great. Okay, Eric Horvitz, you're next. Oh, thank you so much. And this is a great report. A quick question. I, you know, fire, we all know, plays a natural and necessary role in, in, um, in the ecosystem. And some of what we see with the concern about wildfires is concern about the interface between population centers and wildfires. Um, so if we live with wildfires as part of the natural ecosystem uh, and where suppression is unnatural, um, uh, how do we apply these technologies more to managing the fuels, uh, managing the interface between population centers uh, and the expected fires that they should be happening? Um, and I, I do note in the report that you you talk a bit about some of the modeling technologies could be used to guide some of the proactive burns and thinning of forest areas. But I'm curious to hear more about that, especially on the population planning, urban planning, with the rural village pl uh, city planning uh, about the interface. Yes, it's a great point. I would start with the concept of controlled burns and, and prescribed fires because that's a, an intervention that we know works. It helps to improve our resilience to future fires. And yet when you have one of those that escapes, like we had in New Mexico uh, last year, it it can tend to cause the public to become very concerned about doing that in the future. So one of the things I'm excited about in developing these technologies, both on the modeling side, as you described, but also giving our firefighters the ability to respond more nimbly, to have better situational awareness around those prescribed fires, is that it'll make those interventions more effective and hopefully reduce the incidence of those escaped fires, which can compromise some of the really important tools we need to broaden resilience. Um, the other point I would add, you said it well, in some ways we've gotten to the challenge today because of oversuppression. You know, there are fires that we do need that are good fires, what we're trying to do here is give firefighters the tools to be able to make those decisions more effectively, to avoid the escaped fires, to avoid those fast moving fires near the urban interface, where other fires that are wildland and that are, are that should be let burn, we can continue to, to, to do that and let those natural ecosystems continue to flourish. That's great. Just a brief follow on. I mean, might the federal government in the future studies get, get more involved with uh, decisions and guidance about where to put new uh, housing, for example. Yeah, I think that's a big ask, Eric, because I mean, zoning codes and development decisions are, you know, they're really city and county level yeah. actions. I think, uh, you know, there might, there potentially, and there's beginning to be an avenue through insurance uh, provisions where you can and cannot insure, but direct federal involvement and intervention that is clear you may not build here, I think is a is a heavy lift. And if I can look just briefly back on the points that John made, you know, weather data uh, seems like a trivial piece of this, but, you know, more refined weather data able to get into the hands of crews in near real time into crews on scene uh, would be a tremendous boon, both to prescribed burns and to the question of 
whether a natural burn should be allowed to go or not. It's very, currently not very granular and it does not reach active uh, fire yeah, monitoring thanks. and firefighting crews with any real, it only reaches them with very unduly high latency. It's old data when they get it. Thank you. Hey, uh, Kathy Wotecki, you're next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have an observation and, and, and a question. Um, the observation is that I think the lens that we've brought to this problem, the lens of focusing on the firefighter safety and the firefighters effectiveness really uh, surfaced a, a, a very important gap that we have nationally with as large as this force is and the, the lack of any coherent, cohesive way of uh, bringing s &T to bear on improving safe, their safety and effectiveness is, is a really important one. And the analogy with the, with the military uh, R&D in support of the, the, the warfighter uh, in improving his and her uh, safety and effectiveness is a, is a really good one. Um, which then brings me to the question of uh, the recommendation to establish the, the joint office with cabinet delegated decision-making and, and nesting that within the uh, existing NIFC, um, which really has an operational uh, focus. Um, in, in the analysis that, that has been done so far, uh, do you think that the, the uh, existing statutory authorities to the various uh, secretaries uh, who's will be delegating these to the, this right. new joint office are sufficient in this area? And uh, are there additional mandates that might be required? Yeah, Kathy, I won't claim that we have a an nth degree of detail comprehensive answer uh, to that. Uh, my own take, knowing the Department of Interior and USDA to the degree I do, is uh, I, I think they probably do have sufficient if they chose to use them in that way. As best I know, their, um, their mandate to fund wildland fire science and technology exists. Uh, the purport, current proportions of investment into prescribed burns and, and long-term resilience treatments versus wildfire technologies, as far as I know, can tell, is an elective balance, not a not a function of mandates and prescriptions. Um, we you know we recommend housing it in NIPSI. You know, the National Energy Agency Fire Center is best understood, it is just a building. It is a building where the multiple agencies meet and they discuss and debate until they come to a consensus decision about what to do. Uh, that is good in many ways, but it has the effect that one dissenting vote means something stalls and does not move forward. So there's no one at NIFSI that can look at all the technologies available and all the demonstrations or tests that have been done and said, this one is clearly more effective, and that's our highest priority need, we're all going to move out on that. Uh, so that's the kind of you know, unity of command in the Defense Department sense of unity of command that we're aiming to get established here. And John, maybe you have something to yeah, add. I would just add that in terms of NIFSI versus, uh, say, standing up a new organization, I think we debated the pros and cons of, of different arrangements to get to this joint uh, unity of command that, that Kathy described. We saw when we went to NIFSI a very effective organization. As she said, it's a location, but a location where the various agencies work really well together on the operational side to put out an existing fire. And so we can imagine, given the appropriate staffing and resources, a similar type of joint uh, effort on this side of s and uh, tech translation into operations uh, being housed at a similar location. And I think it would be important to have a close connection between that s and development and the operations so that it's not a bunch of you know folks like myself who will go off and have a really interesting tech idea, but that doesn't really move the needle for our firefighters. I think it's important that that tech development happen in really close coordination with the operations side. And that's why NIFSI, I think, is, is a very effective home for this. And that's one of the complaints we heard from members of the Wildland Science and Technology uh, 
commission uh, themselves or the coordinating group for the science, technology, and investments that no one was bringing the perspective and need of the operational firefighter to that table. It was the research types, the academic types, uh, and no one focusing on the operational realities and not user informed. Good, thanks. Hey, Andrea Goldsmith. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, this was a really wonderful report showcasing um, the actually tragic holes in the use of science and technology uh, to empower our firefighters um, to do a better job and to save lives and property. So thank you very much to everyone on the committee for, for putting this together. I had two comments, the second of which built on um, Kathy's comments. So first, in, in recommendation number one, where you talk about currently available commercial technologies, I think that should be broadened to encompasses also defense technologies that might be used here, as well as other um, uh, police EMT technologies. Unfortunately, the way um, wireless technology has evolved is in silos. So there's a silo for defense, there's a silo for commercial, and then the stepchild of all that is what's been provided to firefighters, police, uh, EMT. Um, but there is so looking across all of those technologies to see what's available to firefighters today, I think would would perhaps be more empowering than just looking at commercial technologies, which are not meant for this specific use. So they may not be as resilient or they may not work in the areas where the firefighter needs them. On recommendation number two, and this is building on, on Kathy's comment and the responses, um, uh, it is gonna be tricky to figure out the right way to um, drive the science and technology to support the firefighters. It obviously needs to be very intertwined with the operations. Um, and, and I realize there may not be a perfect answer or even the right answer, maybe it needs to evolve. But what I worry about in terms of what's described in the report is not necessarily having sufficiently bold investment um, for these science and technologies and how whatever the investment is, is gonna be driven. So it wasn't obvious to me, like if you think about, we give money to NSF to fund technology in a particular area, we give money to NIH. If we were to allocate some budget to develop this technology, how would that actually be spent by this organization? So I think maybe trying to clarify that a little bit more. And that specifically weighed in on recommendation number four, where you talked about developing better modeling. Um, how would that be driven? You know, that's a research area. You know, if we had access to this data, how would we bring academics in to use this data and, and develop better models? How would that whole research program be um, formulated and funded and evaluated? So, so those are my specific comments, but overall great report. And uh, thanks again to the committee for putting it together. Thanks, Andrea. Maybe I'll, I'll give a quick stab at each and then Kathy jump in where, where I leave gaps. On commercial, uh, I completely agree. And in fact, the, the main report, we tried to highlight some of the technologies in DOD, for example, uh, that have been developed in, in Afghanistan, for example, communications and rough terrain is a huge issue. Those same radio technologies in, in some cases could be used here, mobile area networks, which of course you, you're a world expert in. Uh, so the word commercial there is, is narrower than we intended, and, and we'll revise that to clarify that we really mean anything that's currently existing in some uh, sphere of, of operations today, so that it's not a lab prototype, but something that's out in the world being used right now. Uh, so you're absolutely right there. In terms of the budget spending and how we can ensure that uh, we're not only supporting incremental work, I think what we've tried to highlight is the idea of, uh, uh, of highlighting the needs of the firefighters, not a particular solution to that need. So firefighter needs to be able to assess a fire that's over a ridge where they can't physically get to it uh, in time. What are different other approaches that people might have to be able to do that type of, of a, a situational awareness assessment? And ideally, this funding would be agnostic to a particular solution. And so we've been able to explore different approaches for doing that, matching that to the realities of what a firefighter is actually able to use in concert. Uh, and then lastly, on the modeling, we're actually fortunate here because NSF, the private sector universities over the past five years in particular, have actually become very active in this space of, of modeling. In the West here, the UC system, Cal State, Stanford, Caltech, because we're experiencing these fires every summer, unfortunately, researchers want to be able to do more in this space. One of the key bottlenecks is this a lack of access to data in a really fulsome way. So you can, through control as, as CUI controlled uh, information, get some of these fire detections that are available. But there's others that we think would help to be able to support 
research that's already funded by NSF, a, a FIRE program down at San Diego. That's a significant research effort. Lockheed and NVIDIA and the private sector have a, a research effort there. So we're looking to plug into what is already an engine that's, that's starting to turn over. Uh, Kathy, did you want to add anything on those points? Yeah, I would just add two points, starting with the latter. Um, Andrea, it was, I think, a deliberate decision to not try to specify too exactingly what programmatic mechanisms uh, should be or could be stood up to engage the academic community. It, a, a lot of this would hinge on what level of declassification the DOD determined they could reach uh, with these data. So we deliberately, we, we can rethink it again. We'd welcome further discussion with you on the point, but, but that was a deliberate choice to not uh, overstate that. On the how to drive the broader science and tech agenda, uh, our, the tool we hope would be most effective there is this technology assessment that we mentioned in the report. And we were inspired in that sense by the kind of very, really quite rigorous end-to-end -end tech assessments that the Defense Department is famous for, really digging into what are the operational drivers and limitations at each stage of an operational chain from start to finish, and then stepping back and, and having as dispassionate as possible a debate about which of those is the highest immediate leverage and payoff to the warfighter. Not, not which is of greatest interest to an academic partner, but which is the highest payoff in the quickest fashion to the warfighter. Uh, the, the team, the tech team at the National Interagency Fire Center has actually already started putting one such together. Uh, we suspect they would be well served by having some external expertise an analytical power, help them with that. But that would be where we would hope to start. You lay that in front of everybody. You have good rigorous debates about the high leverage points and you attack the high leverage points. Okay, Jen Richardson, you're next. Thanks, this is um, really uh, great and, and just thoughtful yet somehow um, specific yet also comprehensive. So that's a really uh, fine line to, to um, tread. So well done. Um, I have just one um, small question slash point, maybe of reflection. Um, as I got to the end and you mused a bit about how this could be maybe a, maybe a blueprint for other climate resilience, resilience challenges. I didn't know if you had specific ideas in mind, not that you should add to the report, but I was just interested. But what actually jumped out to me more is whether or not there were clear um, or at least likely um, benefits for firefighters more broadly, not just those who are fighting wildfires. You see like, you know, that this actually is likely to me going to also benefit firefighters more broadly. And would it be worth saying that, um, especially if you, you know, think it's true, but of course, if you have some specific ideas in mind, so then, it, you know, so it's still focused on wildfires and who's fire, you know, working in that space. But I can imagine that anything that is developed here to especially protect those firefighters will ultimately benefit the larger community of firefighters, no matter where they're working. So just wanted to raise that. Thanks, Jennifer. Good point. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump in on the last point first in terms of the dissemination of these technologies beyond the wildland firefighters. That's a place where the U.S. Fire Administrator, I think, is a really key point uh, person in in this activity. She has decades of experience working in more conventional structural fire areas and other emergency management. And the fire administration also lives within FEMA, which uh, of course has purview over a variety of other types of disasters. So. Certainly in the area of situational awareness, for example, these same technologies where we're trying to help the firefighters understand where their, their colleagues are and understand what, where the disaster is could be translated to those other uh, arenas as well. A big picture challenge that I think we saw is that within the federal government, we, we should have groups like the joint office we're proposing that are thinking about s and around these other uh, disasters we're seeing, you know, we've had extreme storms here in the West, uh, drought, you name it. And I think what we would like to see is this uh, example for wild, wildfires, potentially uh, temp as a template for ways in which we could bring s and to bear across the federal government in a more cohesive way, as opposed to the more ad hoc way in which we seem to be using s and right now. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, Bill Press. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, 
I wanted to I want to jump back into this discussion that's rotated among several people. I think um, Kathy Wotecki started it on the joint office and perhaps give a few sentences of additional explanation for the public viewer, because it may not be clear to them uh, how important this piece of our recommendation is. Um, within the federal government, there exist many mechanisms for interagency coordination and cooperation. And as several speakers have alluded to, they vary greatly in their effectiveness. I think an overall statement would be they can coordinate, but they very often can't get much done. Um, something very different is a joint office that actually carries the authorities jointly delegated of more than one cabinet secretary. Um, the, the whole concept of authorities delegated by Congress is central to the smooth functioning of government, and we've picked up on it here. Yet joint offices that cross cabinet lines are actually pretty rare. Um, we, we came to this because of, of the very favorable publicity uh, just some months back that was given when the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of Transportation delegated authorities to a joint office that was to build out, that is to build out the nation's electric vehicle uh, charging and other infrastructure. So, so picking up on that, um, we're really looking very directly to the secretaries of interior and agriculture um, to pick up this kind of leadership that's needed and establish this joint office that we're recommending in, in firefight, wildland firefighting. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, those are great points, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Dennis Asanas. Yes, uh, thank you, Francis. So um, first of all, Kathy and John and all members of this group, this uh, is great work, very timely, and kudos to all of you. Uh, you've done a very nice job of reconciling some of the operational realities with the science and technology opportunities and possibilities. Um, in the recommendations that you have, which are all very, very sound, I wonder if it can be made even more clear uh, what are the relational time frames for some of those things? In other words, what is truly low hanging fruit that can be done in the next uh, now, in the next six months to a year? What is like in the year to two, and what is a bit longer term? Either because offices need to be created, or policies need to be passed, or you know might simply not be ready uh, for that. Uh, and again, there is some urgency, as we all sense from President Biden. So I think that 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 could make things even stronger. It's just a comment, but perhaps you have a reaction already. Yeah, thank. Go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to say Im implicitly in the structure, I, I think we have intended for the first recommendation to represent the most immediate need, the thing that needs to be done yesterday, frankly. Yep. Uh, whereas our fifth recommendation, looking toward the future of firefighting and technology development is a longer term uh, endeavor. In the main report, we, we do give some target dates like uh, the end of FY24 for, for starting to train our firefighters on the use of some of these tools that already exist to enhance the situational awareness. Whereas we look toward FY27 for the a field demonstration of robotic semi-autonomous, uh, you know, technology. So that's the, the it, it's within this say one to uh, four year time frame in which we think a lot of this could happen. But our prioritization really follows the the numbering of the recommendations. We can make that more explicit. Thank you. Yeah, just because of the executive summary, you know, executives tend to read the executive recommendations. So just yeah. make it super clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great point. Good, good point. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, um, Dan Arvizu. Yes. So let me just add my uh, personal uh, uh, thanks uh, and uh, to the uh, the quality of the report. It's uh, outstanding. You guys have done a marvelous job of continuing to improve, kind of from where we were. I've got a uh, maybe it's a tangential type of a question. Maybe uh, requesting some insights uh, from your uh, from your uh, perspectives on on going through this process. Um, and it has to do with um, there, there's, a, there's a connection, uh, I think, relative to the ecosystem of how we manage forests in, in particular with kind of the, the, uh, the agencies that are already involved, uh, USDA, several members have already discussed that. The, the biggest, the biggest uh, um, uh, maybe connection that I'm trying to, to, to understand better is 
uh, in New Mexico, wildfires are, are, are up close and personal because we had such, such a huge, uh, you know, event last year. Um, it actually damaged uh, an agriculture experiment station that uh, my university actually manages as the land grant university for forest reforestation uh, and, and, and our seedling, seedling bank. Uh, now, as a as a practical matter, we've got four or five of these seedling banks across the across the the, the country, and uh, we, multi, we we manage multiple states. But frankly, um, the research and much of the implementation for those seed banks have not really has not really been provided by the by the federal government. So, where we had uh, when the fires occurred, we we were supposed to have four or five million of those seeds. We only seedlings. We only had a couple hundred thousand. For, fortunate for us because that we only had part of them damaged. But the point of all that is, is that there's a connection between the research that goes on with reforestation. How do you implement those? The Met towers, the agricultural infrastructure that's 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 present in the Southwest. It seems like that could be something of value, especially in the longer term recommendations that relate to how do we improve our knowledge and understanding of the health of these forests and how we implement, you know, restoration of those kinds of things. So have you given that much thought and maybe some additional thoughts on that? But great report just to just to add to the others. Yeah, Dan, I, I think your comment gets uh, pokes at the same thing we spoke about did earlier that. Uh, the key agencies involved here, the two largest, are, as you note, Interior and Agriculture with the Forest Service. And they see themselves as land management agency. So within both of those agencies, the kind of infrastructure that you're talking about, the, the weather towers, the ag infrastructure, you know, inside the department, inside the cabinet department, those are a thing unto themselves, being you know, structured, managed, and run for that purpose. Uh, there's not been much perspective at leadership levels of how to integrate those into the broader picture of the totality of department responsibilities. If you come down several levels into the more close, closer to the firefighting level, say at the Forest Service people at National Interagency Fire Center, they see it that way. They, you know, they hunger to be able to reach across their own department and pull some of those assets and get access to them and use them. And there are all sorts of internal cultural and other barriers. Uh, that they have to overcome to do that. And again, the people you're asking to try to find their way over those barriers are living a very tough cycle of fight, train to fight fires, fight fires, refurbish your gear, refresh your training, fight fires. So the time it will take to get through the, the thicket of all those hurdles uh, is kind of beyond their ability. Yeah, tough. I'll just add one exciting piece that I hope will, will make its way into the tech assessment is uh, the need for a really granular time resolved uh, assessment of our fuels, of the forest. So what happens right now in order to understand the, the potential path of a fire or to go back to Eric Korvitz's question about building communities in areas that are resilient to fires, you want to have accurate data about what what's planted there, what's its soil and moisture, when was the last time there was a burn in that area. Right now, a lot of those maps we have are only updated every couple of years if we're lucky. A lot of it has to be validated by boots on the ground, people hiking those locations because you want to get underneath the canopy. And so this is a place where s and could do a lot more, where a lot of the commercial low Earth orbit satellites could provide better data to inform the modeling, but then also to your point, Dan, to help us understand where afforestation efforts or reforestation efforts uh, really should be prioritized. So it's a really exciting connection between this immediate problem we're talking about wildfires, but the bigger picture of uh, forest health in the country. Okay, Terry Tao. Hi, it's a good report, very compelling and lots of actionable items I can expect to see uh, lots of like visible progress uh, if we implement them in the near future. Um, my question is about the role of, of state and local firefighting agencies. Um, I was wondering if, if there's a role for them in these recommendations. I could imagine that some of them are a bit, a bit more agile maybe than, than the federal agencies and maybe they could be used to attach to implement pilot projects. Or maybe they already have some innovations that that uh, uh, the, the federal um, firefighting um, agencies could copy as a model. Um, so I just wonder if if, if uh, you have some comments on that. Yeah, you're you're right on, Terry. They they are in many, <clears throat> not in all instances. In some instances, there's a fire captain that rose up through the ranks, and his mindset remains, you know, boots and axes and shovels and kind of he's got a two or three year term as the as the chief and just wants nothing to rock his boat 
but there are a number out there. We had some long conversations, for example, with the San Bernardino County fire chief, who is a lean forward guy. He sees the technology uh, prospects and potential. Uh, the, the fire doesn't care about jurisdictional boundaries between the Bureau of Land Management or the for U.S. Forest Service and San Bernardino County. It goes where it wants to go. So we often find the county and state guys are aggravated when a fire crosses a boundary that puts them in the same fire with federal partners. And their federal partners don't have the quality of gear, don't have the interoperability, won't let their better devices be used on federal land in some cases. So it is a bit of a mixed bag in the state and federal forces, but there are really real good points of light leaning forward. And notably, the National Energy Interagency Fire Center brings some of those state and county people to the same table. So you have voices at that same table with the feds uh, that can speak to that potential and speak to the practicalities of getting it done. Great. Okay, Lisa Cooper, you get the last question in this public discussion. Okay, I think my question, first of all, congratulations again to the, the team on an excellent <clears throat> report. My question is more pragmatic. Uh, at least two of your recommendations uh, mention uh, the need for an increase in funding. So I just wanted you to comment briefly on um, the response you may have gotten from the stakeholders um, you spoke with about that uh, increased funding, how they intend to attain that or use existing funding or whether or not there were any sort of specific procedural or um, you know congressional barriers to uh, getting that funding. And you want to kick it off? Well, I will say that the the Forest Service, for example, uh, has had a longstanding challenge of being properly funded to handle the suppression. And those costs have been escalating uh, enormously to the point of well over a billion dollars annually uh, for suppression. There is budget flexibility to allocate some of those funds to the activities we're talking about here. Although I can understand from their perspective that them feeling like they want to put their resources into the most immediate need. It goes back to Kathy's earlier point of, you know, ask her as soon as she gets off the shuttle what she's going to prioritize. It's going to be those immediate needs. So while there is some flexibility on paper to be able to uh, dedicate resources to this, <laughs> I do think it's going to require leadership at the from the president, from the, the cabinet secretaries to say that we're going to also look to the future here and try to carve out some space, uh, fi you know, in terms of the, the budget uh, for these activities. I think it would be most effective in the future president's budgets, for example, to have this as a carved out area of uh, protected funding for these activities, rather than the larger pot where because of the immediate need of the day, there's no funding left to support these types of activities. Yeah, so the activities that we're talking about in, on several years, we know have been allocated at the beginning of the year, you know, two to $4 million, which you could begin to make some progress on one or two things. But if it's a very active fire season, that all gets swept back into the suppression. So the two budget categories involved in both interior and ag tend to be, um, preparedness and, and suppression. There's not been any kind of dedicated line for firefighting methodology or firefighting protection. Uh, the only other comment I would make is, it, I think in all of these cases, certainly in the first couple of recommendations, the numbers involved, the dollars involved are really quite small compared to the current level expenditure overall. Um, several millions, a couple of tens of millions could begin to make quite good progress on a number of these recommendations. The overall budget for firefighting is in the billions. Uh, and we did a pretty detailed dissecting of the current budget allocated to firefighting, wildland firefighting, science and technology. It's, as I recall, in the tens, several tens of millions range, if I recall correctly, the proportion of that that in any way bears on safety and effectiveness of the firefighter was you know a fraction of a percent. So there are funds available that you could you could make a 90 20 or an 80 a 90 10 or an 80 20 split instead of a 99 and one split and advance progress there. Uh, the final comment I would make, and we only have this sort of third hand, so you know, not to put too much weight on it, 
but we've heard from a couple of people closely involved in this that there are members of Congress in the most affected states that are eager for the two key departments to start to move in this direction and would welcome a report that lays out a game plan and some specific actions that could do that. Great. Great question, Lisa. And uh, John and Kathy, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation and the answers to those questions. And thanks to the PCAS members for very constructive and insightful comments. And given the very positive uh, commentary on the report, uh, which I uh, share that enthusiasm, I feel very comfortable in calling for a vote for PCAST to accept that report. So I, I think we can do it by voice vote. Um, so all in favor of accepting the report, uh, uh, please uh, let your um, uh, intentions be known. Any abstentions? Okay, in that case, uh, congratulations to the Wildfire um, Working Group. So in addition to John and Kathy, um, we've got Inez Fung, Steve Pakala, Bill Press, and uh, the late Ash Carter, um, all of whom put just an incredible amount of time um, into uh, bringing these uh, uh, very actionable recommendations, I think. So I'd like to let everyone know that um, the report is going to be formatted and copy edited before its release. Um, and uh, that should be, uh, everything should be done by about mid-February. And then when the report is released, uh, it will be available on the PCAST uh, website at whitehouse.gov slash uh, PCAST. Okay. Um, we haven't received any um, comments from the public, so uh, nothing in that regard. And um, and therefore that brings our public session to the close. And uh, I'd like to thank the PCAST members for participating and uh, thank the general public for tuning in. And uh, before I close, I'd just like to um, ask my co-chairs, Francis Arnold and Arthi Prabhakar, whether they would like to offer any closing comments. I'll just briefly say that this report uh, used a lot of brain power to figure out where can the levers be pulled to use science and technology in the benefit of the American people. Wildfires are an exponentially growing problem, and they will continue to occur and cause damage even more so in the face of climate change. So these interventions that are recommended are very, very important. Thank you very much to the working group. I'll, I'll echo my my thanks. I think this was uh, actually a pretty tough topic, and I, I think it's landed in a place. Time will tell, but I suspect this is going to be a very useful report, and I want to thank everyone for it. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. And this concludes uh, the public session. <laughs>